the Pentagon syndrome. There's something sick about U.S. military spending. It's certainly not keeping anyone safe. This week, why we the public spend billions on bad technology and what happens to service people who speak up. Then, a peace economy. What might that look like? I'll talk to Jody Evans of Code Pink. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. So what gives? Three decades ago, revelations that the U.S. military was paying $640 for an aircraft toilet seat ignited wild media coverage and public outrage. But to no avail. Last year, the Air Force paid $10,000 for a toilet seat cover. Just the cover. Our spiraling military budgets don't necessarily make for better defense, but they do keep growing. Meanwhile, the system is putting service people's lives at risk more often than not. Here to discuss how this mad military money machine or Pentagon virus works, I have Pam Campos Palma, a political strategist and veteran of more than a decade in the U.S. Air Force, Phyllis Bennis, a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies, who directs the New Internationalism Project there, and joining us from Ireland via Skype, my uncle, Andrew Coburn, Washington editor of Harper's Magazine, and the author of the article that sparked this conversation, The Military Industrial Virus. It's a piece you will really want to check out. Andrew, let me start with you. Your story drew on decades of your research. Were you surprised by the kind of drop-off in public outrage about Pentagon spending? Well, a little, although, you know, things have gone downhill in so many areas so much that I suppose I'm inured to uh, <laughs> to uh, disappointment and depression. Yes, I mean, I thought the $10,000, the one you just, uh, example you just cited, the $10,000 toilet seat cover, I mean, I mean, the six hundred and forty dollar. That was a. That was like you got the whole toilet seat for that. Now they rip you off just for the cover. It did surprise me a bit. I really thought that one would have legs. Phyllis, you you work on the Hill as part of your work with the Institute for Policy Studies. You you talk to both Democrats and Republicans. You bring these sorts of subjects to their attention. Is Andrew right? And am I right? Is there a kind of inurement that's happened, if that's a word? I think that what's much more important than the immediate response of people on the Hill of any party uh, is what happens in social movements. I think that's how we change things. And it is difficult. I mean, I think the, ironically, the $10,000 toilet seat is the least of it. The real issue is that 54 cents out of every discretionary federal dollar goes right to the military. And that's why there's not enough money in our budget when we are the richest country that ever existed in the world, in the history of the world, that's why there isn't money available at all times for education and health care and jobs and infrastructure and green technology and all these things. It's because of the diversion to the military. Do we even know but, how much we're spending on the military? Let me just bring Pam in on this. Do we actually know what the numbers are? So, as you mentioned, I served um, after 9-11. Um, I served... Um, in a time where I think increasingly there's this big elephant in the room where we call ourselves the most powerful military in the world, and yet we don't see ourselves being functional. Um, we even see ourselves as a very mismanaged and lacking in an organization that's just lacking in transparency and that is run like a corporation. Um, and so I think one of the interesting parts of the article was this mention of whistleblowers. What is the protections for people that are going to say, hey, this isn't working, something here smells like fraud, waste, abuse. We have a plague of fraud, waste, abuse, and the people whose job it is to um, bring checks and balances are not only complicit, the military investigates itself, and politicians um, have an investment and an incentive mm. in raising up a war economy. He makes a very good point in his piece, Phyllis Andrew, when he says, you know, every other kind of technology has reduced in price. Right. From your every piece of consumer technology, it isn't inevitable that the price endlessly inflates. Not at all, and I think that is a, a huge issue. We do know some numbers. The, the folks at my institute at IPS have worked with the people at Brown University at the Watson Institute there to track the cost. And one of the numbers, just one, this is 
the approximation of the cost of the military from 2001, from the 9-11 the moment, until 2018 is $5.6 trillion. Now, that doesn't include a whole bunch of stuff, but it includes the, the basics of the Pentagon and the wars, and that one includes some, not all, of the, of the veterans' costs, looking ahead to what we've already committed to, because so much of these wars were paid for with a credit card, yeah. essentially. So that's a number that I think most of us can't even fathom. But I think that what we do have to look at is that we know that these wars have cost enormous amounts of not only money, but lives, the environment has paid a huge cost, cost in human rights, cost in international law. I would just disagree with Andrew on one thing, which is this notion that it's not a very, you know, it's not a very strong military, it's not a very good military. We have killed hundreds of thousands of people in these wars, and that can't be left out. I don't that think he would deny I'm sure he wouldn't I, I'm sure he wouldn't, that. but he didn't say it, and so I think it is important to hear to it you, in Pam. this context. When you were serving and you were in the Air Force, were you aware of the flaws? I mean, what was it like? One of the most glaring pieces of my experience is um, how this mismanagement and corruption has led to brain drain. I have seen the best leaders leave the military because it is so obvious. There are running jokes about how we can't even get our computers to work, right? Um, Mattis himself, two years ago, um, was very angry that we spent $28 million on camouflage new uniforms. Um, I mean, I can't even remember how many times we switched uniforms, and these uniforms, these most recent uniforms, actually had a higher propensity of getting us shot at. Wait, no, how so? So explain that. Um, the the camouflage. So there, like, the camouflage was not congruent with the environment that we were in. Simple things like this, to me, and I think to many folks um, in the community, we see that we are flooded with money, which has made us not really have a responsibility. And the other really big point that I would add to Andrew's piece is how we put so much stake on um, weapon systems and military equipment. And people also are government property. And it's fascinating to me. I mean, we can't have this conversation without also naming that the Department of Defense is making all of these cases for more weapon systems, and yet we can't even take care of our people, yeah. right? Saying that transgender health care for service members is too costly. Um, and so this is leading to a brain drain. This is leading to um, internally questions about, is this a legitimate service? And what are we doing here? So if you were in the service and you said to somebody, I mean, and you're like, we're wearing the wrong colors. Is there someone you go to? Like, what happens? How do you, how do you even blow a whistle? I mean, it's that a, it's a constitute <laughs> whistleblowing to say, wait a minute, we're in a brown place and I'm wearing green. To my earlier point, I think that we have a lacking, um, we have lacking accountability mechanisms even within, right? We really depend on the inspector general. I think that we have a missing conflation of listening to high ranking officers who have a stake and not necessarily, um, and also don't have a vision or an understanding of what's happening on the ground. Do we listen to enlisted troops, right? Politicians often will listen to generals, um, but you will very seldom see enlisted ranks who are experiencing the often traumatic and problematic um, operational costs. To come back to you for a minute, Andrew, on this question of the, the pipeline of information and who has what stakes, um, what would you add to what Pam said and who did you talk to for this thorough piece. Everything she says absolutely, you know, just rings so true. It's, it's exactly that. I mean, what we have is a system that doesn't care about people, you know, and that's true across the board. I mean, the communication, I mean, it's going back to the very first point we were discussing is, you know, what's the sort of the lack of into the lack of outrage. I mean, I do find that the quality of defense reporting has gone down. It used to be you know, the Washington Post and people would have sort of a few tigerish reporters who would actually have good sources in the Pentagon um, and would, un you know, would blow the whistle, would, un you know, not blow the whistle, would uncover stuff. And there's much less of that now. The other problem is, um, you know, is the, is the further corruption of the Congress. Um, well, I mean, the, the, the whole lobbying scene, the whole, I mean, the Project on Government Oversight recently released a fantastic report on the revolving door. I mean, the degree to which every single three and four star general and lower ranks immediately on retirement and collecting a fat pension, by the way, um, then goes to work for a defense contractor without exception. Um, so we have a, you know, we have to understand just how corrupt the system is. You make a very important uh, case that 
in fact, what you just said, that the motivation is money. It is not security. It is not defense. It's not keeping even our own service people alive. There'll be people all over the country watching this saying, well, that's not fair. Um, really, is it really all just about money? Make your case. Well, I mean, let me give you an example, an example I talk about in the piece, which is, um, I mean, I was drawing on a very excellent series or investigation by ProPublica on the collisions in the, um, in the Pacific, Western Pacific, a couple of years ago, uh, when two, you know, basically billion dollar US destroyers managed to get rammed or collide with uh, merchant vessels, well, an oil tanker and a merchant ship. And the reason was that these, uh, the crew, the equipment, you know, there's plenty of equipment, this shouldn't happen. I mean, you know, any yachtsman will be able to avoid being run into by a, by a tanker or anyone else, but the radars didn't work. The crews weren't trained to repair them. Uh, the crews were exhausted because they were being sent to sea all the time to keep up a high tempo of operations for whatever reason. Um, so they had no time to be trained. Uh, there was you know, a failure of leadership. And the core reason for all this happening was all the money, you know, the Navy was plenty, was plenty as we know, plenty of money. The money was all being spent on new ships, uh, which, you know, would then be equipped, then manned by crews who weren't trained and, you know, put with radars that didn't work properly. But the whole point was to spend the money uh, and thus gratify the, you know, the shipbuilding lobby who would then give money, more money to their favorite congressman and so on and so forth. I mean, it's, uh, there's so many, I mean, across the board, this is what happened. Is it just a virus? I mean, is it just an infection that's unstoppable, Phyllis? I don't think it's just that. I think that there is a system in place that has been in place since at least the post-World War II period where you have the production of military stuff, whether it's shipyards or planes or bombs or bullets or guns. All of this stuff is produced in an extraordinarily inefficient way. So instead of doing it all in one place where you, you know, you're not wasting time and money and, and energy and fuel and all those things, sending pieces around the world and that sort of thing, you have exactly that. So that you have for every major uh, military project, for every new plane that comes off the board, the F-35 is everyone's favorite because it's so obviously not either what the Pentagon wants or needs or works, it doesn't work at all. You have a situation where almost every military, uh, sorry, almost every congressional district has some jobs producing some widget that become part of this. And as a result, members of Congress, even those who believe that the military budget is way too high, who believe that the wars are wrong, they're going to be very reluctant and in most cases simply will not vote against it because it's jobs. At the same time, if we look at this question of the, you know, if you look at boys and toys in the military, as they like to say, before there were significant numbers of women in the military, the, the toys get way more money. And right now we're looking at a situation as recently as 2017, just two years ago, when these were the last figures we had, 23,000 low-ranking members of the service were making so little money that their families qualify for food stamps. Is that's there a significant difference on the Democratic side of the, of the aisle? Well, that's what's changing now. Traditionally, there hasn't been very much. There were differences where individual members who tended to be Democrats would be opposed to specific wars. You would have anti-war Democrats. But almost inevitably, not always, there were some exceptions, but never enough to make a real difference. There would never be enough people willing to vote against the military budgets. What we're seeing now is that there's a whole new crop of people in Congress led by the extraordinary, mostly young, mostly women of color who have come in, the squad of about six who are taking the lead to challenge some of this military assumption that has been so unchallengeable for so long. And that's what gives us some hope. That and the fact that at the level of civil society movements, social movements, are mobilizing in a way we haven't seen. So just recently, a new coalition pulled together by Public Citizen called for cutting $200 billion out of the military budget. The Poor People's Campaign is calling for cutting $350 billion. And what's important about those two is not just the amounts, which are, you know, they're, they're not chump change here. These are serious cuts. The group pulled together by Public Citizen has 20 different organizations that signed on to the coalition. 
Of those, only half, only 10, are traditional peace groups. The others are environmental justice organizations, immigrant rights organizations, fair taxation organizations, all the groups that are coming to understand how the military budget is the biggest reason, it's not the only reason, but it's the biggest reason why we don't have the money for a Green New Deal and for Medicare for All and for jobs and for health care and all those things. What role are veterans playing, Pam? What role are you playing? And, and you know, even as we've described how sort of irrepressible this Pentagon machine is, mm -hmm. um, what are you doing to try to stop it? Do sure. you have faith it can be changed? Sure. I mean, I find a lot of hope um, also in our movements, and I see that this is a cross-partisan issue. Um, I see vo uh, veterans of all different stripes, military families with members who are still in the military who can't speak up for themselves, organizing um, and getting more educated on the um, military industrial complex and on, um, like a big question that we're asking is which one of these presidential candidates um, who is taking contributions from defense contractors and the security corporations. Um, and interestingly, and most importantly to me, is the threats of the future we cannot shoot at, right? So we are ill-positioned right now. Um, and this case that we keep making around lethality, um, around fear of the unknown, the global war on terror, right? It's, it's a ruse to get us to open up our pocketbooks to keep kind of um, giving to this um, ghost that we're chasing when we know the threats of the future are climate change, our cybersecurity, are a slide into authoritarianism. Um, and, and we see that by not tackling this, militarism is steeping into our communities. The militarization on the border, the militarization of our police force, um, these are things, and I think veterans intimately who have been deployed, who understand what security is and is not, are rising up and saying that this does not make us safe and we need to have a bold vision of a prosperous future um, where we're looking at, at um, truth and reconciliation, right? Dip diplomacy first, diplomacy at the top and diplomacy at the bottom, transatlantic relationships. Um, and so I see veterans, not just here in the US, but for myself, I'm working with German counterparts um, who also understand that we need to shift our model. Andrew, um, I want to come to you on the upside of what can change for the better. Uh, and I want you to address that, but I'm also super conscious of what is happening right now as we speak, which is a um, expansion of little conflicts that speak to me of just how dangerous it is to have so much stuff deployed in so many places if it's really just for an arms, an arms bazaar. Well, yes, I mean, it's a, it is very dangerous, you know, it's obviously what's on our minds at the moment with this situation in the Persian Gulf. Um, I, you know, I, I, as I say in the piece, I. Obviously, it's important, you know, we shouldn't be having these armed conflicts. We shouldn't be, you know, the ones we hear a lot about, like in Afghanistan and uh, Syria, and the ones we hear almost nothing about, like in North <clears throat> in Africa, um, where we have a growing presence. Um, we shouldn't be having them anyway, uh, for all sorts of good reasons, but particularly because I think we have to see that this is another way of spending money. What can be done, Phyllis? We've got about a minute. We build movements. We build movements that understand the connections, that we can't separate the Green New Deal from the military budget, that we can't separate the need for public housing support from the military budget. And when all of these movements together begin to look at all the ways in which we have to redirect the economy of this country, taxing the rich, taxing corporations, and cutting the military budget dramatically, so that's why the work of the Poor People's Campaign, the work of veterans organizations like Pam is talking about, the work of the new coalitions that are coming together to focus on the military budget as a necessary component of working for a Green New Deal and Medicare for All and free college education. We're at a moment when big ideas are on the table in a way that they haven't been for a generation or more. And every time it comes back to the question, well, that's a good idea, but how are you going to pay for it? Well, here's part of the answer cut the military budget. Phyllis Bennis, you can find our article on the military budget and the Green New Deal at Jacobin. Pam, thank you so much for coming in. You can find out more about Pam's organization at our website. And if you want to read Andrew Coburn's piece in Harper's, we'll put a link at our site. It is well worth a read. Thank you all. Great discussion. More to come. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show.
What is to be done? After two decades opposing U.S. wars, the women of the feisty activist group Code Pink have kicked off a campaign for what they're calling a peace economy. I had a chance to talk with Code Pink co-founder Jody Evans at the TED Women Conference a few years ago. Here's some of what she said. We started 15 years ago, a few weeks ago, and we didn't really start an organization. We came together in Washington, D.C. to call Code Pink as Bush was frightening the American people with his color-coded terrorist alerts, orange, red, and yellow. You know, we thought that we would sit outside the White House and be rational and say this war is crazy and unconstitutional and illegal and it's going to open Pandora's box and you don't want to do that and it's going to cost way more than you're saying and it's wrong. And 15 years later, it's worse than we could have ever imagined. In Iraq and around the world, we're now participated in like eight wars. We have more bases than we had, and more money is being spent on war out of your tax dollar, and we need to really take on the whole war economy and grow local peace economies, which has been really a wonderful way to spend the last couple of years, and it showed up as we celebrated our 15 years and went to different cities and how much more engaged our community is in their own community and in understanding, you know, what is a just transition and this war economy which is oppressive and destructive and extractive. And I call the peace economy the feminine economy because it is the caring, sharing, giving, relational, resilient economy without which none of us would be alive. And the war economy is what drives us to death in its extraction and oppression and destruction. So, you know, just kind of look at what you do in the day and what happens when you think, when you're operating your day out of separation and out of scarcity, that's the war economy because we actually live connected in abundance. So we actually have practices as we grow local peace economy where each week we practice one of the things like time. Time, whoa, where the war economy just wants to use your time up. What if you broke free of your time and just like, oh, what if I give my time to the peace economy? What does that look like? What does it look like to give and to share? And after a couple years of this, I can promise you, you're happier. The one thing that everybody is is happier, shinier, more alive. And really the war economy is deafening, it's deadening. And um, it, you know, it takes away your creativity. And we watch it all the time at Code Pink, just in our own work, how it's the natural thing. Like, I need a result, I need to be efficient, I need to deliver. And instead of like, how do I be in relationship with this person? How do I step out of clicktivism into relationship with my own community? I think when I really came to the realization about the war economy, it was global inequality, global climate change, and $1.4 trillion worth of weapons sold every year. The only result historically has been fascism. And I saw growing local peace economies as a way to address all of it. Because if you're relational, if you've built trust, if you're working together, you can write out pretty much anything. And if you look at the different cities that kind of are local peace economies, even like look at Asheville, North Carolina, the unemployment stayed the same in, in 2008. Houses were taken away from people. You know, when you demand relationality and you own your own utilities, when you've, when you've pulled power back and you've not let everything be privatized, you survive these situations that are gonna definitely happen. The Congress and the White House are Teflon. I can't really go after them right now. And the anti-war movement, if we're gonna build, we have to have something that we can win out, some lever we can pull. Well, our schools, our churches, our cities, our states, our pension funds, and our Congress are all making a killing on killing. So it's a way that everyone can engage. There's some piece that you can engage in and engage in locally, which is always a problem about war, because it's so overwhelming and so complex that people just like, I don't want to think about it. It's not hit me yet. But it's hitting the US every day more and more. And in our communities, um, you know, veterans, veterans' families, uh, police killings, people are starting to recognize, oh, the war is home, it has come home, it plays out in so many ways. It plays out in policing is now 30% of some city budgets. That we think that being violent is a way to solve anything is now part of our culture and it's part of our thinking. And so we hope to like show different ways of, yeah, capitalism is bad, it's there. I keep telling people when they're growing their local peace economy, they don't have to worry. It's not going to fall apart too soon. You, we actually have time, a bridge, to where we can be growing the alternative. 
it just takes our creativity. It, it's the, the sense that war has always been, or this is the only way. We have to break that. That, well, first of all, manufacturing jobs, I mean, if you stick with the capitalism, those jobs are going anyway. You know, jobs are going. How do we recreate the economy so that it works for everyone? And that takes everybody being present. And the, the problem is, is when you leap that far away, the way we're gonna find that out is by starting. We don't ever know when we start on a journey towards somewhere what the end result's gonna look like. It's the first, the commitment that I am gonna start out on this path. A just transition the, you know, is about us taking the power back. It's not about demanding it from corporations. It's not about demanding it from our governments. They're all failing us. They have failed us for a very long time. It's a wake up call to find out what needs to happen, make it happen, make it happen with your neighbors and your relations, and make it happen with a diverse group of people because really, pretty much today shows us yet again, it's all up to us.